I am Wendy Mocky, your trusty host for this afternoon's session. And I am Zooming to you from the unceded lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations. As you're aware, we are joined by two incredible guests, uh, Anna Spargo Ryan and Laura LaRosa. Just before we kickstart the questions, Anna and Laura, if you could please let everyone know what country you are Zooming in from today. So if Laura, if you would like to go first and then we'll uh, hand it over to you, Anna. Sorry, um, I'm just having a technical difficulty. Can you just jump back to me after Anna? Sorry. Yeah, sure. No worries. Sorry. Yes, I'm Anna. I'm trying to fix something. My... Hi, um, I'm broadcasting from the unceded lands of the Bunwarang people of the Kulin Nation. Fantastic. Thank you. How are you going there, Laura? Is it, are you all yeah, good? I'm good. Sorry. My, um, I've got AirPods and as much as I love Apple, they can be a nightmare, but I think I've just got to the bottom of it. Um, I'm actually floating around Ngunnawal country at the moment. I'm um, in transit, making my way back home to Darug country. And with that, I would like to briefly um, pay tribute to elders um, and pay my respects. Not, not just the elders who look after the country I'm currently a guest on, but anyone who's joining us and also my own elders who allow me to kind of do what I do. So. Incredible. Thank you. Thank you, ladies. Um, we are so happy to have everyone join us this afternoon. The year 2020 has been a really intense time in our world, globally, nationally, personally. So it is important to hold space for conversations regarding self-care. I want to offer up a quote from the great Audre Lorde who said a very important thing, which is caring for myself is not self-indulgence, it is self-preservation and that is an act of political warfare. So uh, first question, Anna and Laura, you both write with such honesty and courage. You are daring in the way you openly share in order to shed light and you are daring in the way you interrogate oppressive systems. I would like to know where does self-care sit within your writing practices? So uh, Anna, if you could take this question first and then Laura, if you just jump in whenever you're ready. Um, for me, self-care forms part of a bigger approach to making sure that I stay well while I'm writing. So writing about mental health um, often requires a deep interrogation into thoughts that can be pretty hairy uh, and sometimes re-traumatising uh, and oh, occasionally dangerous. For me, it's self-care is one part um, of a, a very deliberate um, approach to making sure that I am as well as possible. So that is doing my own care for, for myself <laughs> to just define self-care, uh, but also working with a therapist, um, making sure that I am transparent with the people around me who care about me um, and, you know, I guess leaning on people who are able to support me uh, in a way that I hope is constructive. Like I, I have a, I've been in therapy for 20 years, so I have a quite a structured approach to making sure that I am as healthy as possible. But um, in terms of actual self-care, I think the hardest thing that I have learned about self-care is that often it's the things that I don't want to do. So what I want to do after I've written something hard is lie on the couch and eat several bags of chips. And But actually what is helpful for me is to push through some of the things that are hard to do that, um, that help to reset my brain or that help to reinforce that I'm safe. And um, that was a very difficult lesson to learn. So for me, self-care looks quite different from maybe what I imagined it would or what, you know, like reading Vogue had told me that it would. It wasn't just keep a journal, watch a, a rom-com and put slippers on and, but actually quite deliberate work to, um, to reinforce the, the neural pathways and the, the um, things that I knew about what I needed, even though they were hard to do. Mm. Thank you. Do you want me to jump in? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, that was great, Anna. Um, I think what Anna was saying about things like doing the things that are quite 
difficult to do even when you want to take the easy way out or you're quite exhausted I can relate to that it's always a bit of a um a bit of a juggle um I also like therapy um, I'm not sort of myself I'm not someone who's in um <clears throat> periodical therapy but I do go when I need when I feel like I need to um and it's quite funny because um I didn't sort of see um a psychologist until maybe in my late 20s and the more I sort of talked about what practices and things I do to look after myself and my head the more I realized I was already using a lot of clinical strategies um so I find that quite interesting in terms of self-care as a writer it's you know it's I'm also a graphic designer and I find writing is far more exhausting um, it's far more challenging than, say, doing something more kinesthetic and visual. Um, what what do I do? I'm still figuring that out. I thought I had a pretty good grasp on self-care until COVID hit and kind of put our worlds into chaos. Uh, so in terms of offering something tangible, I tend to kind of take things a little bit day by day. And I also try and tread quite lightly. Um, just in terms of what I achieve in a day because I've got a bit of a history of, um, you know, going to just hyper-focus and then kind of burning out. So I'm trying not to do that. Um, and just kind of... Ooh. I think we're uh, having a bit of a lag issue here. Um, <laughs> are you there, Laura? Yeah, can you hear me? Uh, we can hear you. Uh, yep, now you're back. Sorry, it just you just cut out there okay. for a couple of seconds. <laughs> I'm, I'm, as I said, I'm in quarantine. So if it does that, it, it will do that occasionally because I'm on my hotspot at the moment. So, but did you catch all, all that? <laughs> Just um, if you could just uh, just the last maybe your last sentence that you said. Sorry, it just cut up for like a second or two there. I actually think if I stop using the AirPods, it will help. Can I just turn them off? Yeah, yeah. Let's let's see let's see how that. Um, hopefully that makes it a little bit more better. How's that? How is it from your end? Yeah, okay, we're good, we're good. Yeah. Did right. you catch any of that? Um, just that, so, so... If you, you... want to just jump on the next question. Okay, no worries. We'll, Sorry, we'll, um... where did you go? No, no, all good, all good. Um, so I'm... I'm in... Tr um, I would like to know because speaking of 2020 and how much, I guess, the year has been, you know, kind of a massive uh, and co complex one for people to navigate, how has that, I guess, affected um, writing for you and your normal kind of way and processes that you would that you would do um, that you would write? Because um, it, it can be quite isolating now that you know we we had a large portion of this year being in isolation and trying to be creative during that time. How has that affected you as a as a writer? Anna, Anna, if you want to step in and answer that one, and then we'll go to Laura. Sure. Um, I had a lot of friends who said that well, I once lockdown started, that this was an ideal writing situation. These are the ideal conditions for writing, that you are on your own, you can't go out, your computer's right there, you have heaps of time, you've lost your job, so what else are you going to do except write? And I just found that completely baffling. I found all the creative energy had just been drained from my life. Like, what's the, there, I had a, just this lurking, overarching question of what's the point of writing when you're trying to keep your family alive? Or, you know, when so many people are sick and dying, and I mean, it was off the back of the catastrophic fires, and it just seemed hard to prioritize creative output. Why would you do it? What's the point of it? How do I feel good about it? How do I maintain a sense of contributing something important and useful um, when it seemed so uh, like lacking in function 
surely there's something I could do that is actually helpful that isn't just reflecting on my own feelings. And, mm. and I wrote a couple of pieces during lockdown about lockdown and it was hard to feel as though while I was writing them, hard to feel as though that was a necessary thing to do, that that could in any way be useful for anybody. Um, but what I found was that a lot of people did relate to them and find something in them that help them to feel a bit less isolated and I mean that was probably that was probably the only time that I saw an actual tangible benefit of what I was doing I have found writing during lockdown to be extremely difficult um, and not ideal conditions at all just like a get up and worry about the state of everything I mean especially with the election in the US and that just to worry and worry and worry and then have to park that in order to try to get some words down and mm. the dissonance that I feel between what is important in the world right now versus what I'm doing which seems so insular and introspective um, it, it's been yeah I've found it really hard. Has that has it affected your way of also a practicing self-care um, during the, the times in quarantine or in, during the lockdown? Is that also um, Yes. That? Yeah, I mean, the thing for me, I don't like going outside anyway. I work from home normally, so the actual circumstances aren't that different for me, but the um, need to make sure that I am still pushing myself to try to step outside of my comfort zone when my comfort zone is all I'm allowed to be in and that I found that part of it to be very challenging I'd go well I like only going five kilometers from my house because any further than that starts to make me feel a bit uncomfortable um oh but I'm not allowed to isn't that convenient I'll really lean into this idea that I can't go anywhere else um it it has been very important to me to try to keep finding ways to reinforce this um, idea that I'm not, I don't have to be inside this space to be safe, especially because we were all, the, the news was telling us every single day, like you have to stay inside to be safe. And, and my brain just went haywire. Like I've, I've spent all this time working with psychologists to believe that I didn't have to stay in a space like that to be safe. And now the premier is telling me that actually it's illegal to not stay inside that space to be safe. I'm going, well, was I okay? I don't know how to, <laughs> I haven't learned, like, what, I don't have any tools for this. So a lot of my self-care during lockdown has been just little amounts of pushing myself a bit further, trying to find new ways to understand how to manage the boundaries and stuff, which has been, yeah, really, mm. like, objectively, outside of it, kind of interesting, but, um, right. but yeah, difficult. Yeah, what about for you, Laura? How is self-care um, during lockdown? How's that been affected by the... Um, um, Look, I originally with lockdown, it didn't impact me too much because my life didn't change too much because similar to Anna, I actually work from home. I just stopped. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, yeah good. you're good, good, good. Sorry, you're good. Um, I just stopped going to campus with uni. So it wasn't really that different. I think for me, um, it was in terms of writing, there was all this horrible stuff happening and so many people dying that I found it really difficult to see where my voice was kind of relevant when the whole world was kind of going into chaos and so didn't really write for a little bit and then I put out a couple of big pieces I think that probably took much longer than they normally would for very very similar reasons to Anna mm. um, and for me personally I think I found this year um, quite hard because it's the longest I've been without seeing a family member. So I haven't actually seen a single family member since December. Um, so that's been really difficult, but that's, look, I, I'm part Italian. I've always been a big eater. Oh shit, my internet. Is that better? Yeah. Sorry. Have we caught the, the Italian big eater unstable. part? Yep. <laughs> And, you know, I, I got to a point in lockdown where I realised I wasn't doing as well as I thought I would when I was mm. writing and it was four o'clock in the afternoon and I realised I hadn't eaten yet. Um, mm. And, look, even non-writers and non-creators 
I think everyone across the board can kind of relate to this. Like, it's just been, um, yeah, it's been tough. And for me, it wasn't COVID that made this year hard. It was, you know, some personal grief and other things. So mm -hmm. I think it was going to be a difficult year anyway, but I think it is that just kind of universal energy of worrying about how, how everyone's doing, seeing people see love, lo lose loved ones and things like that. That's been mm. the biggest challenge for me. Um, and I think everyone's really felt that to different degrees. Yeah, we, um, we are seeing more and more that self-care is being reframed as a form of community care. Um, I would like to know, Laura, um, what does that mean to you? Yeah, so um, I guess for me, I can't help be part and contribute to my community if I don't look after myself and vice versa. Um, in terms of community care, I mean, if we want to talk about, I guess, um, in Aboriginal communities, whether they're kind of fragmented or they're a little bit more traditional and on country, I mean, we're, that's, we are kind of experts at community care. Um, you know, we've been doing that long before, you know, long before Australia was invaded and and in there, that extends to looking after country and that type of thing. So, and I guess as sort of um, non-cis men, if you like, we're always like, we spend so much time just looking after each other, um, checking in with each other. So you can't really keep on top of that unless you're okay and you're doing. And I think in terms of, I'll go back a little bit in terms of, and I've written about this in a piece, you can put a piece out there, right? And say if it's a little bit agitation based, it's gonna be part of a much bigger thing and so the piece is out there, you've written 900 words or 600 words and it's made a little bit of an impact and people are talking about that for a couple of days. Mm -hmm. But there might be three months of agitation or, eight or even 12 months of agitation that's, that's kind of happened behind the scenes. And, um, you know, for example, with all the stuff with Me Too, that was all very much coming from um, the pockets of survivor communities. So there's this one on this one hand, and I think <clears throat> I touched on it earlier when she talked about being re-traumatized. On one hand, we're doing our work and, you know, that's what we do. But on the other hand, we're looking after each other, checking in with each other. And I guess I've been lucky in that when I've kind of felt like I've been really struggling, the, the people that support me have been strong. Mm -hmm. And then vice versa, I've been able to kind of help support them when I've been feeling strong and maybe they've been struggling. And I don't, I'm not sure if that answers your question, but that's no, kind absolutely. of how I see it. So. Yeah. What about for you, Anna? Is that, is that um, how does, I guess, um, community, in terms of community care, um, what does that mean for you? I agree with, um, with everything Laura has said about being strong, to be able to be strong for others and vice versa, that you hope that collectively you have enough strength to get through as a, as a collective. Uh, I think COVID has given us a very literal example of how that works. If you look at um, what's been happening in Melbourne and that the act of wearing a mask, for example, is, is a self a self care of sorts. It's a self protection sort of um, activity, but, it only works if everybody does it together. And I think in right. that sense, it sort of shows us that the power of a collective collective care, that when you take care of yourself and you do the right thing to protect yourself in the spirit of community, that it can be a very powerful thing. I, um, I think also that there are elements of self-care that contribute to a better understanding within community of what is required to care for one another. That if you, you know, even in the sense that um, we've seen, for example, increased mental health funding uh, during COVID from federal and state governments, that what that has shown is an understanding of, sorry, my dogs are demanding to go out. Um, I'll let them out in a sec. An, an understanding that um, there needs to be, in order to do effective self-care, to be well to be able to give yourself what you need, even at a very basic level, uh, that you need 
the support of wider community as well. And I think there have been interesting examples of um, helping other people to help each other uh, all throughout this whole fiasco, this whole process. But yeah, um, yeah. So I, yeah, I, I mostly um, on Twitter where I live um, have seen <laughs> just such wonderful, empathetic community building from a few people in particular, but people who are really um, using the strength that they have to lift other people up in the hope that, and you can see mm. it happening, those people will therefore later be able to lift other people up as well. And this kind of groundswell of just, I, I guess, this, I mean, we've only seen it, I've only been in Melbourne in this whole time, obviously, but um, this wonderful snowball effect of love and care that I think does start with yourself, that you can't do that unless you are um, starting in an inward way, I guess. Just going to let my dogs out. Sorry. <laughs> that, that's totally fine. Um, I guess, and also um, with 2020 as well, I think it's kind of really um, forced people to kind of pause, hit the pause and really take stock of uh, not only themselves, but the broader community and having to think um, past our own, essentially like what's happening in our lives and having to kind of think as a collective has been 2020 has been one of those years where I think we've all had to kind of hit the pause button and reevaluate what's important and what is community and how do we kind of support each other through what is essentially a trying time for everyone. I think um, also, um, sorry to interrupt you. That's okay. Um, the amount that is required to help somebody is, I think we've realized is so much smaller than maybe we imagined. These kind of tiny acts of kindness within community have been very powerful and compelling to watch. You don't have to do something gigantic to make a difference to somebody in a time like this. Yeah. With Anna too, that there is a lot of really nice stuff happening online, which obviously is was kind of a lot of our only avenues for a while. Um, and I'm fairly, I'm still, I keep saying I'm fairly new to Twitter. Um, I thought it was a horrible place when I first went on there because there, there are some horrible pockets of Twitter. And then I did a bit of a curation of who I followed and suddenly realised that there's actually some really beautiful communities on there. And I've seen that and, you know, tuned into some of Anna's work as well, um, which is, you know, often quite honest and vulnerable and, you know, even for myself, people like me who don't always engage with that content, content, we see it and it does help and it kind of makes you realise that we're all going through stuff um, and it's complex, but it sounds very cliche, but we're not necessarily alone in that. So that's been really nice. Mm, and so what, what would you say, like, how could we, how are we able to sustain that level of care for each other? Um, for example, on a social media platform like Twitter or even, um, I guess, as a day-to-day -day sort of practice as a writer or artist, how are we able to then, because movements have long arcs and self-care and collective care are vital to movements. So then how are we able to sustain the importance and practice of self-care as a collective and, and embed that into our artistic processes so that it becomes a part of our framework? Do you want me to jump in? Yeah, sure. Yeah, and yeah, <laughs> please. I honestly don't know how to answer that in terms of how do we sustain it. I mean, none of us really know what we're doing. Mm. We're just building relationships and looking after our loved ones and kind of tuning in to the people who we see are do either doing great work or, you know, just battling through and keep, I think, in terms of sustaining, there can be a lot of dogma and um, toxicity even in um, left sort of, you know, left orientated circles. I think we just need to go easy on each other. I'm not saying we can't critique each other, but I just think well, something that I've, that I've taken away from this year is to just be that little bit kinder. Um, not always. I'm not saying we have to be friendly and not speak our minds, but, you know, I, I'm thinking more in terms of people that I see that are young, are quite a bit younger than me and are going through really similar things that maybe I did. And it's kind of, ref it can be quite confronting seeing your younger self reflected back to you. Um, but 
I'm using that as an example where I could sort of get quite frustrated by, you know, hyper identity politics and all that kind of stuff. But I've really just kind of taken a step back and gone, you know what, just lead with kindness first. Um, Realise that everyone's on a different journey. Some people are really just trying to figure out who they are. Other people are kicking massive goals and other people are just getting by day to day and yeah I think if we just have a little bit more love and respect for each other um without you know without sort of limiting ourselves to also put our voices out there and and query things as well just kind of finding that happy balance Mm -hmm. so that's how I think we sustain it keep doing what we're doing but just do it better better lead with kindness and what would how would you say how well what do you how should we sustain i guess this collective um yeah yeah i think what laura's saying is exactly right and i think that kindness begets kindness it's energizing it energizes Mm -hmm. community to be kind um and there's i think there's a sort of a tipping point where um the kind the energy it, it takes to take a moment to consider how to be empathetic to somebody else which does take energy and can detract from your own self-care in a way to begin with I think there is a tipping point at which that comes back to you and then it feeds itself that if you are part of a community that is willing to try to understand to try to be empathetic to um, listen uh, to expect or hope for the best in people um, that gradually that that becomes the way that that community functions, that it's a safe and energising and um, generous and gentle place to be, which then becomes a place where you can create and you can become vulnerable in a way that you need to in order to create whatever it is that you're trying to do, that there will be someone there to catch you um, if you need to and that you will be that person for somebody else too. And it's, it's this, yeah, I think... Um, and I, I, I agree with Laura that Twitter, depending on how you use Twitter, Twitter can be mm-hmm. a wonderful or horrible place. Um, and I have found it, and I've done almost 300,000 tweets in my Twitter career. And in that That's time, have, is it impressive or is it, <laughs> <laughs> is it shameful and terrible? Um, but I have found that in trying to put that energy out that that is generally the energy that comes back in it's a very it can be an extremely warm generous sharing place and Mm. yeah I I think there is a a lot of it is what you decide you want your spaces to be like what kind of energy do you want to put out and um, how is that going to impact the people around you when you know they need care or or they're in a place where they can give it back to you and um yeah, I didn't realise I was quite this kind of about it. But, um, yeah, yeah. I love and I, I whatever. You from your Twitter presence, Anna. That's how I knew you. <laughs> um, when your name came up, I just kind of had warm and fuzzy feelings. I, was sort of, <laughs> I literally said to Nikki, she's one of the good ones. <laughs> oh, <that's so> nice. <laughs> she's one of the good I ones on Twitter. Remember, that's the brand you were going for, but that's what <laughs> But I do want to say on the flip side that, you know, and in all communities, on the flip side of that, just because someone has the loudest voice or the biggest platform doesn't necessarily mean they're good doesn't, in terms of their messaging or their agenda. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And I just want to give people to, permission to opt out. Like there's, you know, in certain spaces or communities there are, some big names that kind of, um, I guess, occupy spaces within the media. And I want to encourage people to challenge who they're following and what they're reading because, you know, having a big profile or having a big name or a big family or whatever it is doesn't mean that you can't be a good person and can't be kind. And what I've noticed is that there are some big profiles and big names online who are actually quite awful and I just want people to know that you don't have to support them and you don't have to follow them and there are actually other people out there doing fantastic work that you can tune into that 
you know, make make some of these kind of feats look quite insignificant when you consider what people are actually doing behind the scenes. And yeah, so that's just something I've been thinking about a lot. Mm. Amazing. So speaking of Twitter and interacting with people online, how do you both sustain your beliefs and also guard your convictions, but remain open uh, to fostering ways of respectfully, respectfully engaging and uh, engaging different sort of perspectives and, and, and opinions. Uh, Anna, if you well, want to take a thought. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think for me, it is about having an intention to help someone to understand something that is going to make their life and someone else's life better. Um, so I can see there's a question in the chat that relates to this about standing your ground. Um, mm. And I guess for me, it is about making sure that my convictions are well-founded, that I am well-informed, that I am a critical consumer, um, that I don't take everything at face value, that I try to understand better. And part of that is that thing I was talking about before, about trying to do things with empathy, that I don't take my own unfounded, um, ungrounded opinion to the masses, but actually try to come at it from a, a way that is, look, I have investigated various different ways of thinking about this and, and this is the conclusion that I've come to and I would like to be open to a discussion about it. Also, here's the evidence that I have that this is a, a way of thinking about it that is worthwhile. Um, it takes a lot of time. I mean, if you think about Twitter, getting into an argument on Twitter can be just an absolute time sink. But mm. what I have found is that if you are willing to, and if you are able to demonstrate that your position on something is solid and that you are not being an asshole, but actually just being someone who is trying to be helpful and useful and to spread information and to clarify and promote positive change um, that that is much better received in a community like that and I think that's an important thing to do anyway um, so yeah that's how I come at it I guess which is to yeah think and act critically. Mm. Laura how do you approach that? Um, what you were saying Anna about being fully informed and really just being open-minded about stuff and well researched and really believing in what you're putting out there absolutely um, so in terms of guarding, I guess it's a process. In terms of being a writer and having a little bit of a public profile that's sort of, you know, fermenting away, I went from being like a grassroots sort of writer, activist with maybe five followers to suddenly, you know, I was getting published and it happened quite quickly and I was sort of not known for my writing work. Um, Someone else's face has just popped up on the screen. Is it? It hasn't frozen, has it? No, no, no. no, no. I think it's just a profile picture. <laughs> oh. um, just checking. Uh, where was it going? So I think it was quite a shock to me when I started to sort of get known as a writer and had that reciprocal kind of feedback. Mm -hmm. And I obviously am a critic or an emerging critic. So I write about difficult things that make a lot of people uncomfortable, namely white women and white feminists. Um, so I think when you've come up against some of the biggest voices in feminism and media, and you've seen the worst side of that and how that can go, you sort of get to, I sort of got to a point where I was like, well, I've got nothing to lose now. Like I've pissed off all these famous people. Um, they all know who I am. So I may as well just kind of run with it now. So that's kind of where I'm at in terms of protecting and guarding, you know, m my beliefs and where I'm coming from. And, and I think too, having the support of my community and my elders and my cousins and my aunties and, you know, people who sort of cheer you on and sort of say, um, love what you're doing bub like keep going like that's that's massive it's really it's you know it, it helps kind of drown out that pushback mm. yeah because you you both have received 
um, or experience negative remarks and backlash on Twitter or social media, or uh, whether it be like a contentious debate with a high profile person or aggressive and violent attacks from anonymous trolls. So um, I guess in seeing all of that can kind of lead to kind of easily kind of, you know, falling off the deep end. And so how do you protect it when you see stuff like that? How do you best protect your energy and not allow the noise to deplete you? And how do you, re, um, I guess Laurie just said, like in terms of re-energizing, you know, mm. coming back to, to community, but in those moments, how do you kind of protect your energy? I actually, you actually just reminded me of something because the first time that I was bullied really quite badly on, um, uh, say, social media from people, not from my community, from people from communities that you wouldn't expect it from. Um, you know, it really took a, t I'm quite open about the fact that it really did impact my mental health. It got quite personal. All my social media accounts were doxxed and I was essentially harassed and stalked by some women and non-binary people. So it's not the, the sort of run of the mill male troll that comes after me at mm -hmm. the moment. Um, and I actually had coffee with an elder, who's someone who I really respect, who's also a writer and has um, quite a public profile. And he said to me, in those moments when you're feeling like you're having a meltdown, or you're just feeling like a little bit overwhelmed by all this kind of external noise, imagine your silent mentor, imagine their voice, what would they say? And I found that to be a really kind of... Um, good strategy because they'd probably say get a grip like you're all right this is you know and I sort of come back to that and you know, going back around sort of therapy as well like I'm really big on kind of nurturing my inner child as well so yeah that's my way <laughs> Anna um I think mine's a combination of different things I have a similar thing to Laura which is that my therapist taught me to imagine a, a, another version of myself standing next to me caring for me which sounds a bit weird but like to actually visualize a, a less a less chaotic time um and that that me from then holding my hand kind of taking helping me through um which actually is a really helpful thing for me to imagine it it, when she said it, I was like, that's ridiculous. But um, it actually, it's very powerful to imagine that you are able to help yourself in quite a literal way. Um, we can get through this together and it's just, it's just you. But, you know, there are all these iterations of you that can help you on your way. Um, the other thing that has helped me has just been similarly to what I was saying before, um, building enough knowledge to help me be resilient, to know that the place that I'm coming from is, in my mind, not very contentious. And so, so one, often I get criticism from usually a different set of people from who Laura's talking about, male trolls, um, who use the language that I use to describe myself to insult me so like oh my god you're like so borderline personality disorder like yes exactly that's <laughs> that's what I write about I I am borderline I have borderline personality disorder um and they will often turn that language around that I've used to help me better understand myself to use it as a criticism of me and it to begin with I found that just so devastating that I was trying to be open, that I was trying to offer something to other people who might benefit from having this sort of language a bit destigmatized or whatever, um, that that made me susceptible to their sort of attacks. Um, as I have continued writing about it and, and seen the way that other people respond to it, that has become less significant to me that um, it does help other people that um, I had a friend go and see a psychologist and this psychologist pulled out an article about anxiety for my friend and gave it to him and said you should read this this is like the best account of anxiety I've ever read and it was mine and they didn't know that we had any association with each other but, but that I was 
creating a tool that was actually going to help people. And that has become more important to me than worrying about what faceless anonymous trolls think about who I am as a person. You know, I got a string of attacks about how I shouldn't be allowed to be a parent. I've got two teenagers, shouldn't be allowed to be a parent because of my mental illness. And um, that cut so deeply to begin with that, yeah, maybe they were right. Maybe I wasn't capable of being a good parent if I was so anxious and so depressed. And um, But it helped me to also reflect on what I was doing that was good as a parent, that um, the tools that I had created with my therapist particularly, but also through my own work that were going to mean that I was an understanding and caring sort of very, very hands-on, very talk it out parent, but that that was just a different kind of parent and that, you know, no one was going anyway. But um, so I guess to, I do just ignore the, the ones that are really terrible now. I don't block them because I think that's a satisfaction they don't deserve. So I just mute them and forget about them. Um, but that wasn't as easy to do until I had thought about why I was doing what I was doing and the value that I hoped that I was adding and weighed it up. On balance, is this a, a good and useful thing for me to do, even if these people do lurk around waiting for an opportunity to kind of shit all over me? So, yeah. I think your papa wants to come back in, Anna. <laughs> can't hear them. I've got noise cancelling headphones on. Here. Speaking of self-care, my dog has, like, yeah. Come on. Has definitely got me through this year. She's yeah. been in quarantine and that's been, a, been very therapeutic. Um, but just to add to what Anna was saying, it's mm -hmm. very bizarre when you have some sort of public presence when people do build these weird narratives about your life yeah um, and I always look at people like Anna and a handful of others online and think that you're quite brave because I'm very funny like I don't put a lot of my private life out there I might put them into pieces into an actual article but I have the ability to sit there and craft that you know and sit with it for a while whereas on Twitter I'm, I'm, I don't like people to know where I live I don't talk about my partner. Um, you know, if I have children, Twitter will be the last people to know about. It. That's me because I'm very sort of, I guess, private, if you like. Um, mm -hmm. But I guess what I'm trying to say is hats off to those who do put more of their stuff out there in the name of generosity and um, and are able to do that. I think it's it's quite brave and. I don't know how, if you know, how I would respond to something like that. People saying that you shouldn't be a mother because you, you know, you manage your mental health. It's just abs absolutely absurd. Absurd. Um, you know, because you both write and engage honestly with people. So, it, and willing to tell your truths about your feelings and perceptions. And it, and it reveals so much about yourself and how you feel about the world. Mm -hmm. And then you have to, you, you then have to go out and represent it. Mm -hmm. And so it's, and to, to be kind of in that public space and then navigate, navigate that realm can be overwhelming and mm -hmm. intimidating. Um, so I guess I've got a question here from Rowena. Thank you, Rowena. I think this is probably a good sort of like kind of segue. Um, so question for all, how do we as a community address lateral violence within our and other intersectional communities? Who would like I, to go first? I'll jump in. I don't engage with it anymore. Um, I find that people who are perpetrating the most violence uh, don't want to engage with you. They don't want, you can't reason with them. Um, I've, I tried that. I tried I, and going back to what you said, Wendy, about truth, that's how I live with myself. That's how I'm still here mm. after living what feels like a few lifetimes, um, having, you know, quite that, that sort of trauma background, but is self-honesty. I'm honest to my own detriment and I learnt through therapy and other means um, to be honest and I think if you're truly honest with yourself, your intentions, and you're checking in with that kind of ego and that, you know, consciousness, it's easy to just kind of go, you know what, like you can kind of stick it. 
Um, but in terms of lateral violence, you know, there is a lot of it in different communities. Um, and for me, just don't engage, don't try and reason because as soon as that's, that's what works for me. Um, Anna might have a different spin on that, but if, if it's someone who's genuinely curious and wants to engage in dialogue, even if they're challenging you, by all means, that's not violence. Um, if it's people making assumptions about you and doxing your accounts and spreading rumours or, you know, questioning your identity and doing it in just really, like, chaotic, uninformed ways, like, those people, they don't, they just want to silence you. They want you to disappear. They don't want to be, they don't want to engage with you. And I kind of know which, like, am I allowed to swear, Wendy? Oh, sorry, I already did. I, yeah. I, I, I know who to fuck with and who not to, is what I'm trying to say. Like, I know which who to fuck with and who not to. Right. And, you know, I can sort of respect people's work from afar and not want to show up in their spaces. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And I think I'm very much an observer. So I usually have quite a good grasp on different communities well before they even know who I am. And right. so that's kind of the approach that I take. What about you, Anna? I guess um, that for me the risk is relatively low and I feel um, that as a middle-class white woman um, that I have some capacity to try to stand up um, to, you know, call out or call in shitty behaviour. I think what you're saying is right, though, that, the reason that people engage in lateral violence like this is not because they have any interest in a productive or constructive conversation, but actually mm. it's, you know, attacking is... It's projecting. Yeah, yeah, and, and it's very um, closed. You know, it's a, it's a one-way closed sort of attack that doesn't incite further conversation it's not that's not what it's meant for um but I do yeah I do um hope that you know sort of every now and then that someone learns something I guess but um yeah I I try to understand again I guess why it happens where it's coming from mm. um why this person feels this sort of internalized or projecting um negativity but there's only so much that you can take it on and and the outcome of it you know is that energy we have a finite amount of energy is that better spent and I mean we've seen that more clearly with this U.S. election than maybe anything like is that energy better spent on something that is actually going to change minds and help to drive a, a more positive outcome mm -hmm. than trying to engage with the people who are never going to get there um, so I guess it's just making sure that the people it's directed at are safe um, and are brought into a circle of of safety um, mm -hmm. by a community and then to just yeah let, let those people who are attacking them self-combust eventually and I, I guess find, sorry I'll just jump in I find that for every toxic person there's so many so many more kind of loving people yeah. um I mentioned before like when I was sort of first very publicly bullied online um you know there was a small pocket of toxic people that were perpetuating that but what it actually did was um I had some older say let's just say for example I had some older black fellas and editors reach out and go hey I can see what's going on and connect and mm. some of those people have become I've worked with and I've become really close with um so even though you know for every bully for every one toxic violent person there's 10 I, I truly believe there's another 10 people that will outshine them just with their honesty and integrity um it took me hindsight to realize that but a lot of the people I kind of work with now and whose work I tune into um, through, say, Twitter, I realise I've actually met because they did 
they did a really kind thing and reached out and said, hey, I can see this is happening. This, they did the same thing to me or they did the same thing to my niece or right. and so you sort of realize actually this is not even about me this is yeah. part of a bigger problem and I'm just I've just been slotted into this week's agenda <laughs> so yeah I think that's okay. helped um I'll, I'll get I'll take another question from the comments section um how do we avoid attacking one another even in spaces that are supposed to be safe progressive or critical, especially when navigating different cultures, backgrounds, generations, awareness levels. I guess that's, sorry. Just don't attack people is my yeah. <laughs> Just don't do it, just don't. Yeah. Um, we're all grown ups. I think there's ways, you know, it's the same when you live in a share house. Like I just came out of a share house in Melbourne where, you know, we're all in our thirties it doesn't matter how old you are, actually. I'm, I'm, I realise I talk about age a lot, but there's this sort of don't attack people, talk to people, have just be open, honest. Mm -hmm. if, and it's sort of back to that last question. If they're being violent or whatever, don't engage, just opt out, block. That's what I would say. Mm -hmm. Anna? I guess there's always a risk that the position that you take is not necessarily the right position that you need to also be open to um considering another perspective uh and so I agree don't attack each other don't just don't never do it um but also to be willing to listen um and again I guess to foster an environment where it's okay to have a disagreement and that that isn't necessarily construed as attacking but that you know the it's a lot of this I think a lot of this work is done before some of these interactions happen mm -hmm. that it's necessary to continue to always be kind of yeah cultivating this kind of environment so that when disagreement or um or attacks or um different perspectives come up that it is already established within an environment that there are ways in which to engage with it and ways to not do it. And um, like, the, <laughs> I'm just, I'm so like the long game on all of this stuff. It's just, you know, to really put in this work ahead of time in order to be able to better understand it, to be able to respond to it more constructively, to know when to leave it and all of those things. That this is kind of a long-term strategy for engaging with people in general, I think. Yeah. Um, just gonna, just gonna uh, switch gears for uh, just a little bit. Um, so more and more in the current social and political climate, the lines between advocacy and traditional modes of um, activism are blurring. So my question for you both is, what does activism look like in, in the current social and political climate? And would you consider yourself an activist, an advocate, or both? Um, look, to be... A woman to be a young uh, to be sorry to be an Aboriginal woman today is you that you you were forced to do advocacy because that's part that's part of being in community. Um, I I would say I'm a dabbling activist. I can sometimes go six twelve months on a particular campaign or project, and then have six months where I just sort of look after myself and my people. So. Yes, I engage in activism. Would I say I'm a straight, like I'm many things. It's like, you know, it's, mm. I do activism, but I wouldn't say it's my entire identity. Right. Um, in terms of the lines being blurred, I, I feel like, I think that's a line out of my article, <laughs> Wendy. <laughs> that's like an actual quote out of my article about the lines between advocacy community work, blah, 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 being blurred. Um, or maybe my Q and A, but I think we need to really acknowledge people that the work of people behind the scenes, and we need to allow people to contribute in a way that's safe, and realize that you know if you're someone who can't be on the picket line, say for you know accessibility reasons or whatever, and your way of um, advocacy is you know helping people in your street or 
whatever it is, I, I guess one of the big messages that I wanted to put out today is that there's no right or wrong in terms of how you contribute. Um, mm. And we, I would like to take a moment to kind of acknowledge the people that are more quiet contributors because there are far more than we might realise that are doing some incredible work behind the scenes and they don't get the kudos and they don't get the, you know, the magazine spreads and all that kind of stuff. And as well as people that are no longer with us as well, um, mm. that, you know, did a lot of incredible work, whether it was community-based or something kind of more broader that we now benefit from and that may have been forgotten. Um, and that's something that, you know, I really keep in mind with my work is going back as well, not just looking at contemporary stuff, but looking at the last few decades um, so yeah, it's what I, I guess that's what I wanted to put across. Yeah, so um, just really quickly why, I, Laura, sorry, why I asked that question was because, um, you know, the ways in which people, I guess, perform activism has kind of shifted. We've seen a shift in the way people, uh, whether it's through, um, you know, physically, whether it's through their art. And so just kind of, I guess, um, I'm just kind of curious as to how we identify ourselves um, whether we actually identify so ourselves as activists or what form of activism would you say that you kind of fall under or kind of exercise? I, I, I don't think we need to define ourselves. Um, I think we're going to find as the kind of political and environmental situation goes even more chaotic, we're going to mm. be forced into this kind of work. Many of us, on, particularly people in varying degrees of marginalization have been doing that kind of work forever. Mm -hmm. um, I don't, I'm not a big, I'm just not big on labels. Like I don't need to go out and go, I'm this or I'm that. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't need to perform my activism either. Mm -hmm. um, I've been accused of not being a real activist by some of these violent people. And I laugh mm -hmm. it off because I just think if you feel the need to showcase your activism, that's a, that's a, um, unless it's part of the campaign, unless it's central to the campaign, you don't need to kind of wave it and go, Hey, look what I'm doing. Right. Um, I just don't buy into that. And I don't really buy into titles and labels. I find it really difficult writing my own bio. So don't know if that helps. No, not that's not. And Anna, what, how, um, what are your thoughts on advocacy, activism? Where do you find yourself? I think the thing about mental health is that you need, if you don't advocate for yourself, you die. Like it's, there's, <laughs> you don't get a choice. You need to be able to learn to self-advocate and you need, if you have energy, um, to, to become an advocate for mental health in general, but you need to be able to, learn language to describe mental health concerns that you need to uh, be able to create a mental health narrative that is going to help a doctor to understand what kind of help you need you need to be able to be dissatisfied with the system you, otherwise you die and so I am an advocate by necessity I, I think when I started writing about mental health, it was because I was so unwell that it was the only thing that I knew to write about. It wasn't because I thought I'm going to make a difference by writing about my own mental health experience. It was like, I can't think about anything other than how depressed I am and mm -hmm. I need to write. So that was what I wrote. And mm -hmm. people, it resonated with people and they said, oh my God, I feel like this as well. And, and I went, oh, I thought I was all by myself. And in that sense, it then became a political statement that right. I'm not going to be, I'm not okay with the state of mental health care. I'm not okay mm. with the fact that people are getting left behind. And, um, but it didn't start out like that. And I don't think of myself as doing a specific kind of activism. I just am trying to normalise experiences and give people a way of communicating with somebody else the best thing I can do as a writer is to give someone a tool they can use to get the best care that they can so it's yeah I don't know what it is but it's yeah it's a kind of a matter of life or death yeah I find that really um 
I found that really satisfying to hear from you both because, uh, you know, oftentimes people will say, oh, you're an activist or what you do is activism. And I, I, I kind of, I kind of feel like I get a bit, oh, no, that's not, you know what I mean? I, so I, it's nice to hear that I'm not the only one that. <laughs> Um, I'd like to ask uh, uh, for you both, are there any activists, writers or changer makers who inspire you and, and, and why? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I feel a little bit put on the spot, but I mean, I'm endlessly inspired by different writers. Um, I obviously immerse myself in the work of a lot of black fellas. Um, a lot of, I guess, my uh, contextualizing my work and kind of validating it has come from you know reading up on Aileen Morton Robinson people like that um, big fan of like Tony Birch and writers like that who can you know go out there and really um, a real sort of change makers but also write with so much honesty and character and vulnerability as well um, and I guess you know I my kind of advent into feminism was bell hooks and people like that so and musicians as well, artists. I mean, in we, there's just so much, there's so much inspiration out there. So absolutely, yes. And it's actually quite overwhelming at times. Emma? Um, yeah, I think I am particularly admiring of people who are able to create beautiful activism. Uh, you know, it's hard to communicate a message that either contradicts what someone already believes or that is difficult to digest. And I think art's role is so powerful in giving people something that they will want to engage with because it's so lovely or it's so moving or it's so powerful or whatever it is, but that it is different from just telling someone what to think, that it is a way that they can come to it, come to an idea in their own way through art um, so um, a lot of the activists that I admire are writers um, and other kinds of artists uh, as Laura was saying musicians and um, visual artists and playwrights and uh, but I particularly love uh, Yasmin I wrote a list actually <laughs> Yasmin um, <laughs> Abdel Majid um, this amazing American Palestinian poet called Hala Alian, who I was lucky enough to do a writing workshop with. And um, she writes her advocacy and her activism into all of her writing in a way that you don't even notice until you get to the end. And I think that is just such an incredible skill. Um, and in disability, Elle Gibbs, Stella Young was such a, an incredible advocate. Um, I won't call her inspiring because she would hate that, but um, that she that she advocated in a way that was no nonsense, that was not bullshit, that, you know, this kind of, it doesn't, even though I just said it's nice to have art to engage with, it doesn't need to be palatable. It needs to be understood. And I think that um, she did that in such a tremendous way. Um, and, uh, and Tarang Chawla, who um, advocates for, you know, violence against women and um, mm. just people who show tremendous passion and and community in the work that they do. Um, so, yeah, well, yep. Awesome. Can I, I'll just um, quickly um, throw a question from the audience. Emily has asked, I'd love to ask you both about feminism and its role in your own writing arts, uh, writing arts and advocacy practices. I guess I'm especially interested in the tensions of white feminism and its violence alongside other kinds of more beneficial communal feminisms and the values and wisdom of matriarchal cultures where feminism is not the key concept at all. So what is the, uh, what's the actual question? So that's, uh, that's what I've been sent. Um, so I'd love to ask you both about feminism and its role. So the tensions of white feminism and its violences alongside other kinds of more beneficial and communal feminism. So the values of wisdom of matriarchal cultures. Look, I'm a little bit confused by the entirety of that question, but I think the thing that jumped out is the tensions in terms mm. of looking at white feminism. Um, there's a specific kind of corporate white feminism that takes place that I'm obviously quite obsessed with to a degree because I've got quite a corporate background before I went into the arts. So I've had proximity to that world and I've 
lived in that world and seen how it operates. So it's a passion to kind of interrogate that. I think the key thing is, um, and that I try and put across in my work, is that this particular form of white feminism that I write about is the patriarchy. It, it, it is encompassed under the patriarchy and we need to get that through our heads that some white women are very patriarchal, even if they brand themselves as progressive feminists. Mm. Mm. And that's what I want to get across. Um, and that's how I'd speak to that tension. Yeah. So just really quickly, um, I'll just, Emily's just message, uh, uh, commenting, saying, uh, and the role of feminism in Laura and Anna's own work and arts practice. Sorry, my question wasn't very clear. So what's the role of feminism in your own work and arts practice? I'll just say really quickly that in my Q&A, I kind of sort of defined what feminism to me is. Mm -hmm. And I don't really buy into the language of gender equality because I right. feel like it's very outmoded and it, it's very binary. Um, <clears throat> and a lot of the white feminists that are fighting for gender equality are these patriarchal figures that I, they just want to sit at the table. They believe in trickle talent tactics they have zero concept of class because they're predominantly quite middle class or have you know strived to kind of mix in those worlds um so can't remember what what was that sort of clarify what was the question oh in terms of them like for me, feminism is so much broader. It encompasses, it's one of many words, an umbrella term that encompasses things like race, class, mm -hmm. ability, interrogating these constructs around gender. So I have a very different view of feminism and that's how I embody that. I live and breathe that, not just in my writing, but in my everyday work, my mm -hmm. relationships with my family, my brothers, my nephews, like, um, you know, so I hope that kind of answers that somewhat. Yeah, fantastic. It does. It does. Anna, where does feminism sit in your mm. right, your work and arts practice? Um, I agree that uh, that feminism has been able to evolve into something that's quite individualistic. Um, that you know, how can I get ahead as a woman? Mm. And it leaves a lot of women behind and it's not the white women that are left behind. And I think for me in my arts practice, I was raised by a very impressive woman um, who broke a lot of glass ceilings um, in a way that was um, inspiring to me as a younger person, but that didn't give me many models through which to interrogate my own understanding of feminism. And so what my art, I guess, has become is an opportunity to interrogate. And I think in all of, I hope that in all of the writing that I do, that I am always asking myself questions about why I think something, why I'm inclined to write something in a particular way, um, who might be hurt by the writing that I'm doing and to always be mindful of my position as um as a privileged person that, you know, the harm that I can do as a person writing from a position of privilege, if I don't ask those questions while I'm creating art, uh, that has become at mm. the forefront of how I, and like stepping aside when I need to. And I, I guess as well in my role as, um, I'm the nonfiction editor at Island Magazine, to use opportunities like that to actively make space for voices that don't, get space made for them by some publications and to you know, but like to actually do the work and not mm -hmm. to just you know to, to actually think and try and and step aside and make space and lift people up and do all of that work and not just to write pretty stories which is what I like I'd love to just write pretty stories but yeah. that is not acceptable <laughs> so yeah amazing I'm I'm not too sure if we have much time left. I think that that might be, am I correct in saying, are we, are we, are I we out of time? Close. Um, we have hit the time, we are out of time. Okay, sorry, I, I have like a whole page of questions still left, but that's okay. Um, this, that's all we have time for today. Um, there is so much to take away from this afternoon's conversations and I myself have learned so much. 
Um, uh, thank you to everyone watching. Please remember that self-care and activism, these two things are not mutually exclusive. Um, and thank you for being a part of the Feminist Writers Festival for 2020. I invite you all to turn on your cameras and join me in thanking our speakers, Anna Svago Ryan, Laura La Rosa, and thank you to Susan and Linda, our Auslan interpreters. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everybody.